the the vibe of aghoris is one thing is uh, they also worship women so they were cleaning the feet of actual living women because it's shakti they show a lot of respect to the to feminine energy and that's what's believed of shakti some many historians believe that people didn't know that only when a man copulated with a woman did she give birth they just got to see that a woman suddenly is able to give birth and that was remarkable for them so when we even look, i mean look at ganesha he's never born with the help of shiva he's born just through parvati mm. and that must be harkening back to a time when people actually thought women gave birth men had nothing to do with it so we've created a ton of what people call dharmic podcasts on trs we've spoken about the basics of hinduism we've not spoken about the outcomes of following a yogic lifestyle a hindu lifestyle a lifestyle full of upasana or praying to deities this episode is about the outcomes what does practice and study eventually lead to so if you want to learn about the divine feminine and of course if you want to learn about the divine masculine you've clicked on the right episode very intense conversation with the incredible dr neelima chitkopekar i'm not going to talk too much about it what i will say is that if you enjoyed our conversations on hinduism you're going to enjoy this one even more for more episodes like this make sure you follow us on spotify every episodes available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world our meditation app level supermind is also live on the app store on the play store meditation is a concept that we've brought up repeatedly even on this episode as we do with all our episodes and for now i'll let you slip into this incredibly deep philosophical spiritual conversation with dr chitko baker enjoy There's very intense energy in this room today ma'am. It's cuz you're here. Thank you. I can feel it myself. Intense but a very wonderful energy. Nothing to be you know nothing scary. Yeah. Very very positive energy. Neelima yeah. Chitgopekar. That's right. You're an expert on Shiva. That's right. And I know that you've written this book on Shiva about 3 years ago if I'm not mistaken, 4 years ago. Uh well one I've written several books on Shiva. Yeah. So the last one I wrote, yes, it was about three years ago. You're right. The book I want to highlight yeah. of yours that really had an impact on me is the Shakti book, okay. which I've been reading recently, because there's just been such an entrance of Devi Ma in my life. Okay, <laughs> splendid. In, <laughs> That's wonderful. In such strange ways. Okay. Um, it's like in my childhood, I was very drawn to Krishna. I was mm-hmm. very drawn to Hanuman ji. Yeah. And I never really even thought of Devi Ma. And in my adulthood. especially after i had like a big turning point like you mm-hmm. know i had a terrible breakup some career mm-hmm. stuff went wrong and post that it's like the universe gifted me this devi ma energy in my life okay. i found this idol in my dad's study and my dad's not lived in india for the last 12 years 13 years so it was just lying there and it's like the idol found me kept in my old office moved it to my new office and one day when i was looking for something else again the idol found me and then we got one of our most epic podcasts from a tantra practitioner on the same day we found this wow so I've been questioning wow. reality. Ah <laughs> uh, and then your book found me and it's had such an intense impact on my life. I'm reading very slowly. The way to go. Yeah. <laughs> the way to go. First of all, thank you for like the book. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being such a wonderful reader. We authors love to get in touch and meet our readers. I have so yeah. many questions for you ma'am. Okay, great. The first of which is uh, your sense of style. You have a unique sense of style. especially with that neck piece i want to know if that has any significance uh well the one that's underneath this is a the, the gold one yes which i don't know if you can see it's uh it's shiva and he's meditating he's in his meditative posture right so this as well as this om namah shiva i never i have not taken off for the last 20 years maybe i uh, i just love everything about shiva and uh, you can't love shiva without also getting close to shakti since they both are inseparable you know whether you see in the sankhya philosophy purusha prakriti the shiva shakti you know so there the energies that get together and then creation takes place we know that these are all things we all know 
So uh, I love everything about Shiva. And uh, also the women he brings into his life, like Parvati, Sati, Kali, Durga. These are uh, very powerful, very powerful female entities. And it's only and only a god like Shiva who can deal with such powerful women. And that is the beauty. That is the beauty. Rookie question. Yes. As someone who's just learning about these things, am I supposed to visualize that there was actually a really evolved being called Shiva and then there were really evolved female beings called Shakti and Parvati and uh, Sati and Kali? Are these astral stories? Are these physical stories? Or is it stories that actually capture philosophy and then for the masses they are retold as stories? How do you look at it? So the last thing that you said. Okay. So we have so much of mythology in the Purans. And the Purans are what our Hinduism and our, our India is all about. It's not the Vedas. People think, go back to the Vedas. No. Vedic gods and goddesses we hardly worship. Hmm. Barring Agni, who Agni ko sakshi, sakshi, sakshi mankar, you get married, or the last, you know, when, when you die, cremation, the last sacrifice you do to the world and to the so-called higher being is, is your death with the fire being lit. Okay, so Agni is there. Agni was very important in the Vedas. We really don't look at those deities and those gods. We look at all the gods and goddesses from the Purans, which came much later, which were written much later. And those stories and those myths are wonderful. And I would think that those stories come up. It's a, con it's, it's a combination of dreams that human beings have. It's a combination of intuitions. It's a lot of history. It's a lot of the region. It's a lot of to do with the topography and with geography. I mean, topography. If you look at Kamakya, when you have a rock formation, which so much resembles the female vagina, I mean, why would, stories not be built around that? Why would it not happen? Because in ancient times, people really looked at their landscapes in a religious manner. Whether you see it in Native American uh, culture, you see it all over in ancient cultures. Indians did too. Mm. So when they saw that in Assam, they started worshipping that as Shakti. And what part of Shakti? The womb, the actual womb, what creates the world. So I think this last point that you said a lot, it's, it's so I said it's dreams, it's intuitions, actual beings, there may be similar beings moving around at different points of time. Because Shiva was not created at one point of time. What plenty, do you mean? Plenty of concepts got attached to Shiva. First time, when you look at him in the Rig Veda, for instance, he's only called Rudra. He has dark qualities. He's, he's got this thundering, you know, his word, if you break down Rudra, it comes from Rud, howling sounds of the wind, storms, everything that's dark. Everyone is scared of him. People are going to worship him only to appease him. It's his wrath that has to be appeased. They don't love him. They don't admire him. But it's the wrath. It's the anger. So it's just that. How does he later on, after some centuries, become Shankara? How does he get a wife? How does he have two children? All that is the evolving of Hinduism. Taking in stories and myths from different regions, from different centuries, from different peoples. And that's the beauty of it. That it evolved so much. There's no one text telling us, this is how Shiva should be. This is how he should be mani manifested. This is how he should be represented in art, literature, scripture, anything. Uh, so many tangential questions. But yes. because... As a podcast, we are currently in this very history-oriented yeah. zone. I'd actually love to ask you from a very sapiens perspective, yeah. like Harari's book, okay. where he speaks about the evolution of man. Yeah. So it's common understanding that we were hunter-gatherers mm -hmm. before we became mm -hmm. settlers, then started farming. Yeah. Uh, they say that basically temples likely came first or places of worship all over the world came first mm -hmm. because even ancient man just a little bit after he had evolved from whatever the previous mm -hmm. state of evolution was mm -hmm. started asking himself or herself questions about life and questions about God Yeah, because that's probably what solitude did Yeah, made you look at your hands and think what made me why am I here what is yeah. my purpose and then places of worship came up it was the uncertainty of life that made people worship. 
times were such so tough right from the time from the earliest times paleolithic neolithic you see signs of worship and it's usually it's the female divinity because they it, it some many historians believe that people didn't know that only when a man copulated with a woman did she give birth they just got to see that a woman suddenly is able to give birth and that was remarkable for them so when we even look, i mean look at ganesha he's mm. born parthno he's ne, he's never born with the help of shiva he's born just through parvati mm. and that must be harkening back to a time when people actually thought women gave birth men had nothing to do with it mm. yeah so um wow new perspective <laughs> yeah. so, but i'll i'll also give you some of the other stuff for me these podcasts mm-hmm. aren't just me asking you questions yes i have a lot of questions from previous podcasts you okay. know that left me with like nuggets of thoughts yeah um so again going back to sapiens and harai that book has had like a crazy impact on my really? life and i highly recommend anyone who's even slightly inclined towards psychology and history should read that book mm-hmm. um now what he says is it's very likely places of worship came up first they figured yeah. that okay let's all come here and pray together etc and then eventually when there were festivals around those places of worship it became important to have food that supplied those festivals mm-hmm. therefore farming became a thing mm-hmm. and once farming became a thing then settling down became a thing that oh yeah. i guess we can just stay near the temple yeah. that's how towns and uh, cities started and yeah. we see that in indian villages today where uh, the temple is the central part of the village and all mm-hmm. villages are built around temples mm-hmm. um now that's one nugget i have in my head mm-hmm. the second nugget is from an archaeologist we had on the show uh his name was dr prabhakar and he was an africanist and okay. i asked him what's the craziest link that you found between africa and india yeah. he said that in parts of nigeria they worship something that looks exactly like shiva but wow. is a female version of it then now i'll give you one more input i've got from someone called mohsen raza khan he said that classical religions existed of which likely indian religions hinduism is one of the survivors um another survivor would be zoroastrianism yeah. like you know an older world religion yeah but it's also likely that religions like that celtic religion in scotland yeah. or they kind of say the same things when you study yeah. the aboriginal man religions yeah. in australia yeah. even yeah. they're saying similar things yeah. similar concepts you know so maybe early man followed some very ancient version of hinduism and all of us had this shiva element kind of as a important part of a uh, important representation of god the phallus which is the ling the male sex organ this was worshiped in many countries but what is remarkable is that it continues in india today the shivling the shivling now and what is also remarkable and not surprising most people don't associate the shivling with the male sex organ they see it as a style it it's highly stylized now it doesn't look like what it originally was some historians don't even believe that but see they say no it's a pillar it's a representation of shiva it's not the phallus it's not the penis but it is because we have the earliest representation of the phallus in an absolutely anatomically correct image in gudimalam a place in andhra pradesh and it dates back to something like 2nd century bc so 200 300 years before christ there was already this huge lingam which was completely accurate like it was just like a male sex organ that's how it may have started and that's that's something we see in different countries as well but only in ancient times only when you look at archaeology they don't continue to worship today i don't think so i don't know if there's some african nations which continue to worship the phallus but we in india if you go to any shiva temple it's always the shivling and it's placed on what is called the yoni yeah. the yep. coming yeah the coming together of the male and sex yeah. uh, male or, or organ and the female organ but it's highly stylized because it was not pal it was not palatable to the brahmans they did not like it that it was so realistically portrayed so slowly slowly you find that the ling which was so realistic realistic in ancient times started looking more like a pillar like a conical mm. kind of you know the shape that we yeah. see the lingam today the western world calls shivlings monoliths yes. one thing i forgot like in a lot of western podcasts That's like right. i have an idol of mine joe rogan who runs one of the world's biggest podcasts yeah. he keeps bringing on historians who always refer to monoliths yeah and first i thought it's like a rock formation then i realized no these are like man made yes. basically shivlings yes. from other cultures native america yes. uh, south american cultures yes. etc but you have very very uh, you know very much like a male sex organ uh, phalluses from ancient times we have so many of them quite but, a few but why what were they 
it's the power, it's the energy that, you know, sex is energy. Sex is so important. And the male sex organ, the female sex organ, that's what, when it comes together, you have creation, you have reproduction. And in an agricultural society like India, agricultural economy like India, we've always been ag more agricultural pr prone, especially in the past. Then all sexual rights, everything to do with fertility was exceedingly important. So whether you look at Indus Valley civilization, you have small little shivlings. Now, sometimes people say it's very clearly has the head, etc. But they say, no, maybe this is not those who don't, aren't comfortable. They said they could have been chess pieces. They could have been a you know, board game. They could have been pieces for that. How do we not know that they were actually carried by people like the Lingayats today carry the Ling somewhere on their body? We don't know for sure. So it's left, it's left like open-ended. We mm -hmm. don't know because mm -hmm. we've not been able to decipher the Indus script as yet. So we don't know, is it shiv are they shivlings? What are they? But 3000 BC, we already see very realistic looking lingams. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to now take this into a more <laughs> esoteric place and then we can come back to history maybe. No, I'm sure. Whatever you... Because you, you've actually added something to this whole historical narrative that yeah. maybe they started understanding that sex organs can create life. Yeah. That's where it began. Then it became like whole divine masculine and divine feminine thing, yeah. which eventually evolved into imagery of the gods in order to explain it to the masses. But before you even ask me this, I want to say this. In one of the Purans I remember reading, uh, a, a sage is being asked by a disciple that, you know, Vishnu is worshipped through his conch, through his disgust, through his, you know, this, and Indra through his, you know, Vajra and so and so through. different. Why is it that Shiva is the only one who is worshipped through his sex organ? He's asked this in a Puran. So the sage replies, because every man carries the ling on his person and every woman carries the yoni on her person. So he represents all of humanity because the Ling and the Shiva, uh, the, the Yoni and the Ling are together in the temples. That pedestal, that ta, ta, where you put water, the pedestal that said, that's the female, the mm. vulva, the Yoni. So look at the answer. So even in ancient times, they're, they're, they're questioning, why is it? Because it must have been something that was among the Aboriginal population, among the indigenous population. We do not hear of the Ling in the Rig Veda, which is the earliest text. Only later when the population would have moved among the other people, they would have come across the ling worship and they're trying to justify it. Why is it Shiva, why is it Shiva that is not worshipped through his image? Why through his lingam? So the aboriginal people like who were kind of, I mean, I don't like using the word primitive, but probably yeah, yeah. in forest areas? In, in forested areas who had not been Brahmanized, who had not gone into this whole culture of the Brahmins, which we see in, in the Vedas. They were also living in India. It was not a vacuum. So they worshipped? They, they had other uh, methods of worship. They worshipped uh, fierce goddesses. They worshipped the lingam. They worshipped, uh, we have archaeological evidence to show us that. Mm. There's no mention, for instance, of Shakti and Durga in the earliest text. Mm. She came later. She came much later when people came across her. Then the, then the texts were written. The bu most beautiful and first representation of Shakti in the Sanskrit text is Devi Mahatmaya. And that is 5th century CE. 500 CE of the, of the current era, the common era. That's that's when it came in. It's AD for the people who don't. Yeah, okay, AD. Yeah. <laughs> we now see CE, yeah. which is the common era. This is our era. And before that, there was no representation. We see her in sculpture, but we don't see her in Sanskrit. Then she's brought in through this wonderful text called Devi Mahatmaya, where she's quaffing, she's drinking blood, she's drinking liquor, she's getting fierce, she's a martial goddess. She's the kind of goddess that you can't even imagine because even today, so much of whitewashing has taken place. So when we see Durga Puja, she's completely covered and she's got a mild look on her face and all that. This is all, I mean, the bigger word is boulderization, making something more comfortable for the current population's conscious. We'd, in the past, she was a bare-bodied lady going into battle, riding on her tiger. You know, it's it's amazing the kind of goddesses that India has produced, but we are a little embarrassed about them. We're, we're, we're so westernized that we don't like this naked, raw feeling of the goddess. So, mm. you know. Okay. We're going to get back to 2023 now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm going to give you some perspective. I'm so sorry. I'm a historian. So no, ma'am. <laughs> trust me, these are the best podcasts. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I'm, I'll give you context about uh, my life a little yes, bit. Yes, okay? yes, yes. Okay. Um, I've had a relationship with someone who wasn't a Hindu. Mm. 
very open minded though very accepting very non judgmental but she was trying to understand hinduism more and she'd ask me some tough questions which you take for granted when you're a hindu for example she say explain what an avatar is to me yeah because in abrahamic religions god is god yeah okay and then how does god take human form and then come as, as a human and i asked the monks who come on the show these questions i asked people like yourself to get my answers and her questioning me like that actually increased my understanding and therefore the viewers is understanding of hinduism as well yeah okay uh now the thing is in abrahamic religions there is an aspect of demonology as well where um you know if someone is possessed by like a higher power it can be looked at in a negative way where worshiping multiple gods which are not the god can be looked at as paganism which might have a negative connotation hmm. so this made me deep dive into this concept a lot like okay. what are deities what is an avatar and then we had uh, rajashi nandi who's the tantric on the show and asked him all these questions mm-hmm. and he said that a deity which is a representation of god has the ability to be both the deity which has its own powers and its own identity but it's also a part of god yeah. it is god in itself yeah now this is one thought bubble the second thought bubble is from last night and this is what i've been waiting to tell you <laughs> from the time i met you um at 8 pm a close friend of mine calls me and says hey man You know the cola that they've shown in Kantara. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a place outside Mumbai where it happens. I'm not going to name the place. It's mm. this amazing temple. Like I've I've never been to a temple like that. Okay. It's like about two and a half hours away from Mumbai. Mm. Like I'm blown away by what we felt in that temple. I took two teammates. Both these guys were with me. Okay. The cola in itself was not too long. Now a cola is basically where I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Okay. Cola. Uh, okay it's it's basically where they say mata chad gayi okay okay uh, mm. uh, a deity possesses a priest yeah and then they say that the priest represents whatever the deity is trying to yes. say to yes. uh, the people in the temple that's right and to just see the possession and uh, see the deity perform its own dance yeah it was maybe like a 1 minute long or 2 minute long experience but all of us were gripped and all of us were just like yeah like our hands went up in prayer and you knew it was something divine like in front of you okay. i don't even want to get into the details of yeah. what we saw yeah but the boys in the room know exactly what i'm talking about yeah. and i felt pure after this experience i felt like i was ready for today and i was going to bring it up okay in today's conversation okay. the thing is before the cola actually happened uh we went and prayed in that temple which was an experience in itself i it wasn't just a temple of a devi it, it had like multiple tiny temples in that same complex the central temple was a durga mata temple oh. where everything was lit by like diyas and it was the most like what's the word for it? magnetic mm-hmm. feeling i've ever had in my life where if you actually still yourself if you go on an empty stomach if you go with pure intention you can connect to like the temple yeah. much more deeply yeah 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 so i stood in front of the durga uh, mata temple I looked at it, and I asked for whatever my my material desire is at this point, which is not money related. Yeah, like you know, it's something else. It's about like uh, other aspects of life, yeah. personal aspects. Yeah, I I just felt like this very intense energy exchange, and I know I'm talking to the divine yes, here. Yes, yes. And then parallelly, I see the cola happening where the deity is talking through that priest That's and answering people's questions That's and answering right. it kind of in almost a fierce, scary yes, manner. Yes, yes. It's yes. almost scary to look at. Yes. Ah. Uh, <laughs> how do you explain all this now to someone who doesn't understand hinduism exactly yeah. uh, are these possessions how do you look at all this have you looked into these aspects of mata chad gayi what is this mata chad gayi angle how do you explain it to a westerner yeah yeah i would let you go so there's a lot there i mean uh, psychologists say that it's something to do with human psychology i mean they don't necessarily say it's something divine but i do know that in kerala and different parts of the country and different parts of the world you know you go to mexico you go to latin america any country in latin america there are possessions and the pos- the person who is possessed is able to heal i mean not yeah. only answer the questions but is able to heal the people who've come there who have various illnesses and things like that i think it's a combination of lots of things it's the rhythmic um, beating of the drum it's the music it's the incense it's all the senses get alive because everything is there the incense the music the singing the chanting the the waiting everything is there and all that makes you feel psychologically uplifted everything in this world is about rasas 
in especially we in India talk about the navrasas and when everything is aroused in you, you know, you they have a wonderful word in uh, English called horripilation. When your hair stands up, you know, it doesn't just automatically happens. It happens when you're experiencing something. But all I can say is it is it has to be experienced. If it's not experienced, you cannot explain it to somebody. Mm. I mean, it's like a mother saying, you know, uh, I love my son so much, but a person who's never had a son probably would not be able to entirely know what yeah. that feeling is. So you have to feel it uh, and and you have experienced it. Yeah. And so, I I mean, I, I have experienced these things many times. I started off as a dry academic, just looking at sources to talk about Shiva. But things kept happening. How long are you going to call it a coincidence? So then I started thinking, yes, there is something beyond what I'm reading in these very cold libraries. Why don't you share the most impactful experience? Oh, there's there have been many. And I also feel that when you read a lot of the so-called scriptures in Hinduism, and I've had to go through all the Vedas, the Upanishads, the, the Purans, uh, sometimes your intuition, and I also practice a certain amount of pranayam. And at that time, I was doing more pranayam, the uh, incident I'm talking about. So I just, uh, you know, I, I teach in a college and I have a big, large class of, you know, whatever, 40 girls or whatever, usually. And I remember this was a, not an Indian class, Indian history class, it was an American history class. And, I, you know, I had to finish the syllabus, so I was in a hurry. I, I, I enter the room and I can't explain, I can't tell you what happened to me, Ranveer. It was like, there was this darkness, darkness. And I tried to open my mouth and I remember I was, I was going to talk about a certain president in America and words wouldn't come out. This has never happened to me. I said, now what's going on? What's going on? I'm looking around at the students and finally I said, what's going on? So they said, nothing, ma'am. I said, no, something's wrong with this class. Why am I not being able to speak? I actually said that to the students. It was early in the morning. And then one girl ran out of the class crying. So I said, what's with her? So they said, ma'am, her boyfriend, you know, it was Valentine's Day yesterday and he gave her a hard time. And so she went. I said, okay, now let me teach. I'm not interested in all that. I tried to teach again. My voice would not come out. My words would not come out. Finally, I just put down my register and I just started looking at each and every girl. And finally, there was a girl right at the end. Her head was down. I won't take her name. She's well known today. I just looked at her and I said, look at me. And she put her, I said, why, why is your head down? Look at me. She looked at me and her eyes had complete devastation in them. I cannot even describe what her eyes had in them. All I said was, being a practical person myself, I said, leave my room, go down to the canteen. Please have a cup of tea or coffee. Just leave my room. And believe me, she left my room. She got up and I saw, and I was scared at the same time. So her best friend was sitting in front. I said, go with her. Go. I'll give you attendance because that's all that students are bothered about. The two of them left and I was able to take my lecture. I took my lecture. I came to the staff room. The two girls followed me back to the staff. And then they apologized. We are so sorry that we disrupted your class. And then I said, what's wrong with you? I taught you last year. You were perfectly fine. What's happened to you today? Then she said, tell her. The other friend started nudging her. Tell her, tell her, tell her, tell ma'am. You have to tell her. She said, ma'am, the moment you told me to look up, I was just wondering how I'm going to commit suicide. We're on the third floor, ma'am. The rocks are very sharp here in JMC. I was going to jump from that window. How did you know, ma'am? I said, what? She said, yesterday was Valentine's Day. I tried to use the fan and my chunni. It didn't work. Today, I parked my car on the opposite side of the road so that I could get run over. It didn't work. I'm sitting in your class and I'm saying the best thing to do is to jump from this window. And you know, I, try, I, I, I just was shocked at two things. Number one, that this beauty, she's like a beauty queen. She's, she is an extremely rich and... I never knew anything about her because I don't get into the personal lives of my students, unlike some professors. And I said, wait, 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 just hold on. And I was shocked that I could sense it. That was shocking me. Let me cancel all my classes for today because I knew it was serious. I went, I canceled all my classes. I said, come to my personal room. And I took them in for two hours. She cried. I cried. I won't tell her, tell you why she wanted to commit suicide. And I said, I'm not a professional, but you need to see a psychologist right away. She said, my parents are so well known, they will not let me because then the word would spread. I said, then let me meet them. They said, no. She said, no. Then they'll know that I, you know something about our family, about me. 
I was in such a state, I cannot tell you. But finally, she did better sense prevailed. She did see a psychologist and a psychiatrist and she cured herself completely. She is a very successful person today. This was many, many years ago. And to this day, I cannot explain to anybody what was that darkness I felt in that classroom. It's never happened to me like that again. When these kind of things started happening to me, when I became more and more intuitive, sometimes I could read people's minds, what they were saying. Then I got scared. My God, what's happening to me? And my husband used to keep saying, uh, be careful, you're just becoming like one of those Matas, Matajis and all. Yeah. He, because we're an ordinary married couple. And he said, watch it. I'm called Neelam at home. Watch it, Neelam. What's happening to you? Because I was going to London and I, I said, you know, the, what if there's bombing, you know, in 2005. And he said, are you mad? You've gone and stayed in Oxford and you've gone to London and you're so familiar with. I said, you know, the tube stations at night before sleeping. I'm so glad I told my husband. Nobody would believe me. I go to London. I have to give lectures in Oxford. I give one. I'm uneasy the whole time, especially in the tube stations. Finally, I just told Oxford University, I can't give the second lecture. Why? I said, no, I'm not feeling too well. I need to go back home. I come back home and the bombings take place. And you would have been a part of it. I was because it was on that route that I used to take. And to save a few pounds, I used to go early in the morning, like uh, before nine, if you go. I used to set out. I had to go to the British Library. I used to go to you know visit the British Museum. One of the bombings took place in a bus on that trail that I used to walk on uh, to go to the British Library. One of them took place in one of the stations that I used to go to. And I used to feel this uneasiness when I was there. And I was just so uneasy. And everybody was so shocked because England happens to be one of my favorite countries to visit. I love Oxford University. I've stayed there and I just, you know, gave lectures there. I just said, I'll be back. I told them, they said, well, the flyers are out and everybody's coming to hear your lecture on the Sondaria Lahiri. I said, I'll be back. And I went back and I never felt an uneasiness or anything at all. So, you know, these things happen. And how do they happen? Okay, call it coincidence. But why did I say bombing specifically? Why did I say in London to my husband? You know, right before this podcast, we were talking about how we couldn't talk about things like this five years ago. <laughs> and the internet has changed and now we can talk publicly about yes. things like intuition. I also feel that the internet widely accepts that the concept of intuition exists. Yes. Having a sixth sense exists. Yes. My question to you is, other than meditation, what else improves it? Like I've seen that meditation improves it. Now I don't know whether that is because your inner world gets so stilled out that you're able to recognize patterns much more easily. Or there's a deeper layer which can't be explained. But Ranveer, it's not that easy. Sometimes it's very, very scary to be intuitive. It's very scary. I mean, somebody gifted me tarot cards. And I, I mean, I literally opened the tarot card and I could, I could see somebody's death there. And it happened. And so sometimes it's scary also. It's not like it's something that's going to help you. So I don't open the tarot cards now. I put them in a black cloth and kept them away. It's just that, okay, I'll, I'll share this with you. When I was in Oxford the first time, everybody gave me a nickname, Sunshine. And we were at a party, one of my farewell parties, and they took out these tarot cards. And I'd, I've never read tarot cards or anything. And they said, Neelima, ask a question and choose a card. And I opened the first card I opened, it's the sun. And they said, my God, we've been calling you sunshine and you opened the sun. And they just gifted it to me. So looking at books, I tried uh, playfully with my son, with his friends. I would, you know, sometimes read the tarot and it would all come true and it was scary. <laughs> Parallelly, I want, scary. To, I want to give the listeners context here. Yeah. While reading your book, Shakti, yeah. you've put in yantras in that book. Yeah. Yantras are extremely powerful symbols. And when I saw that, my first thought was the person who's written this book is blessed to be able to be a channel for this knowledge. And even the way you've written mantras, I know that there's those pages yeah. Yeah. which just have... Just the mantras are there, yeah, from different text. Now, this is not a book that I would go to a bookstore, me, okay? This is not a book that I'd just go to a bookstore and buy because I'd assume that it's a coffee table yes, book or something yes, like that. Yes, yes, yes. And it's been one of the most powerful books I've read. I'd almost look at it like I, I like a, a children's book for adults. <laughs> and then when I opened it, the imagery, yeah. the yantras, the way you've written the mantras, it's so important for the experience of reading that book. You've captured an experience in that book. Yes. That experience can only be captured when you yourself have experienced things. Yes, I have experienced some things. I, I, I have to say... Uh, I have, there's some very strange things, some horrible thing was happening. And I remember sitting in my car and going to the dry cleaners and, and I was writing the book on Durga. I've written a book called the book of Durga. So it was just Durga on my mind. 
why do you start writing these books do you get some sort it's of it's so dream? wonderful no it's so wonderful the big publishers come to me and commission me <laughs> they ask me to write there's something <laughs> going on on a deeper layer here my question to you is on that deeper layer ma'am and i'll tell you why i've done more than 400 guests i've okay. never felt so eerie yet safe when i'm talking to anyone but i'm feeling that with you i feel eerie honestly but i feel very safe with you Okay, Eri. Okay, um, you know, uh, I, I nobody has this. You know, like when I hear other people who work on religion talk, they'll say, "I won't take the names." They'll say, "You know, I'm steeped in religion because at our dining table, my parents used to discuss the Purans and the Upanishads and Shiva and this and that." Then somebody says something. I've been doing this since I was a kid. I had no background to religion. Nothing. Zilch. part of my childhood was in america my parents are not really like religious or practitioners or anything like that i stumbled into a cave shrine when i was about 11 years old it's called tapkeshwar it's in dehradun tap tap karke shivling ke upar doodh girta tha okay that's the way uh, that's why it's called tapkeshwar and i we all went for a picnic and i don't know what led me there alone now i should have been scared i was barely 10 10 years or 11 years old is this the river cave there's a little river passing through there and there's a there's a proper cave and there's this, many people when they go to teradun they want to go to that i think and, i've been here and many people have asked me where did it all start like the interviews that i've done people have asked me where did it start i had to trace it back somewhere and i said maybe it's tapkeshwar because i went there I stumbled in and I saw the puja taking place for the shivling, and there was a one family there, and it was so empowering. At that young age, I felt wonderful, and all my friends and my family were at the picnic. I was alone there; I didn't feel scared. I should have felt scared. I did not feel scared, and I remember when I had to give the senior Cambridge exam, an uncle of mine said, "You're studying so hard. Ask for anything." Now we were not rich. Somebody. else he had done the same she said i want nice heels somebody else said i want to have you know this you know, whatever i said just take me to tapkeshwar i didn't have a car myself you know i couldn't have gone it was very far from where i lived take me to tapkeshwar it was freezing cold exams used to be held in november dehradun was cold i grew up in dehradun and i went all alone again he stayed up because he had bad knees i went down the steps to tapkeshwar and i prayed there i don't know what came in my mind take me out of this place i want to go to delhi i want to do well i want to get admission into a great college i prayed to shiva that time i don't know how that came over me nobody told me to go to that place i was 16 years old but i think now i can see some kind of thread and uh, so it was first shiva and so when i was asked when i was going to do a phd who do you want to what do you want to work on this is the history department in delhi university very marxist at that time not at all favoring work on religion i said i want to work on shiva and they said what you're a history this is a history department this is not a theology or you know this is not what are you going to do with shiva and i quickly said i'll see i'll look at the social economic background to shiva why did he rise so much in the state of madhya pradesh i had to give it a historical background and that's what i did for my phd but i got more excited when i started reading about shiva then i came across these chosat yoginis 64 yoginis wonderful goddesses i went running to my mentor my guide i said who are these 64 yoginis no 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 nilima stick to shiva i said but they're accompanying him everywhere you write another book about and i did that chosat yoginis 64 yoginis i cannot tell you what powerful divinities they are what does that mean Chosen sixty-four goddesses, situated in different temples only in central India. So Chosen Yogini temples. I mean, everything about Chosen Yoginis is very unusual. Firstly, the temples are almost always circular, not like the usual temples that are built in North India or even South India. Secondly, they are hypithral. Hypithral means they don't have a roof; they're roofless. And thirdly, there's not one, not two, not three day divinities there, but sixty four yoginis, sometimes eighty one yoginis, in a round circle on top of a hill, away from the city. Why away from the city? There were rites and rituals done there which were orgiastic in nature. What does that word mean? Orgiastic meaning <laughs> a lot of sexual content, a lot of you know they were con consuming items that were making them being. 
giving them the feeling that they were flying in the sky. Hallucinations. Oh, like uh, psychedelics? Hallucinatory, hallucinatory things really? they were consuming. Because when you go into Tantrism, it, it, there is the Pancha Makara. The Pancha Makara means the five M's. Madhya Mas, you, you're supposed to have all these things which sort of like make you possible to transgress the norms of society. Yeah, I'll, I'll just give some context yeah. to you. Yeah, please, please. Uh, so this is from what I've learned with Rajashi Nandi. Tantra has different stages. One of the last stages, later stages, includes use of the pancha, pancha makras. Pancha makras, uh, meat, fish, yes. some kind of grain. Mass is meat. And, and uh, some people have actually said mass is human flesh. Some people have even said that. Madhya is liquor. Hmm. Mithun is fish. Uh, not Mithun. Uh, Matsya, Matsya is, is fish. fish. Mithun is sexual uh, intercourse. And what is the mudra? Mm. The fifth one is mudra. It can even mean hand gestures, which are very powerful. Mudra can also, another meaning, because Sanskrit words have many meanings. It can also mean some kind of dry, parched wheat, which it can be hallucinatory when you dry it and drink really? it. Yeah. Really? Mudra. Yeah. So Damn. you have to have these five things. If you become a disciple, if you become a, a, a disciple of, of Tantra, if you convert or you want to be a ta Tantric, then these are the things you have to ingest and these are the things you have to do. The 64 yoginis and it's open to the sky, open space, maybe there were all these rituals taking place there. Because they're not family friendly, let's just say that. One thing I want to say about Shakti. Sure. And I want to say about the goddesses. Sure. What I love about it is they show the goddesses in India and in Hinduism all phases of a human life, of a woman's life. She can be an old hag, ugly as drooping breast with her, you know, all her you know, skeletal, her bones showing. She can be voluptuous and beautiful at the same time. She can be a married woman. She can be an unmarried woman. She can, like I said, she can be old. She can be a widow. We have those, every goddess is, every stage of a woman's life is represented by the goddesses. And when you were talking about why there are so many gods and what happens, look at it, that concept of Ishtadevta. Every human being has the autonomy, has the intelligence. We have, we have thought that the human being in India has the intelligence to choose his or her own desired one whenever they want. And it's like when you started talking, you said it was first Krishna. I mean, you can just move from one deity to the other. You have the freedom to do that. That's the beauty of Hinduism. See, there's a lot that's not beautiful in Hinduism. But one beauty is this whole concept of Ishtadevta. I want this Devi today to be in my heart. I want to worship her. Or today I want this male divinity. And so then at that time, the yoginis must have been looked upon as being so powerful with all the occult practices and mass eating and, you know, doing things that transgress the society, societal norms empowers you psychologically. You know that adrenaline rush that mm -hmm. they say you get when you do something that is forbidden. I would think psychologically that was happening to people when yeah. they were involved in those rites and rituals. I mean, that is definitely a part of me. And this is after doing a ton of podcasts, yeah. including the tan tantra oriented ones. I feel like there are higher beings also around us. And in a way, devis, deities, yeah. as you said, and as I've learned from your book, yeah. it was so much a part of tribal culture as well. Yes, yes. Now those tribal people, if you go and meet them today, they know the forests inside out. Yes, they know yes. their land inside out. They know yeah. all the energies, including energies of the animals, of the plants. Exactly. Obviously, they had access to some higher energies or some higher beings. That's right. So maybe the presence of those beings around yeah. these temples or within that temple enhanced the Tantra practice of the humans, which in its core people, when they think of Tantra, they think of sex, they think of like all these yeah. things which Tantra is not entirely. No, no. Tantra is an extremely fast way of spiritual progression. That's right. Uh, and probably these beings just assisted it in the same way that your football coach can teach you how to play football, but at the yeah. end of the day, you have to play football. So the coach is just present and telling you what to do. Yeah. So you get Mukti. In Tantra also, you need, mo you want Moksha. The ultimate goal is Moksha. But you get it through Bhukti. Bhukti means Mukti. You get mukti through bhukti. That is, bhukti means bhog, means you enjoy everything in this life. And it's all about the body. The deha is not dirty. It's not something to be just uh, discounted the way it is in most of the ascetic religions, even in, within Hinduism. It is something to be taken care of. And that's where you also come in with a lot of scientific knowledge. The tantrics had a lot of scientific knowledge in the past. They were so good for an agricultural country because they knew how to get rid of the vermin in the fields. The tantrics would be called. They knew which medicines to use. They knew about chemistry. So there was a practical use there also. 
And they were probably the ones who also looked at the body. You know, in, in Hinduism, Brahmins and all the higher castes would never touch a dead body. Then how are you going to get to know about medicine, the physiology of the body, unless you look at a corpse and study it? The tantrics used to do it. So they had medicinal knowledge as well. So it's not, it was not all bad. You know, now today in today's age, not today, last, last 30, 40 years all over the world, people think tantric, oh, that means free sex and oh, great and all that. But it, there was a lot more to it when you look at it historically. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you continue about like the temples, like you said, the Chaucert yes. Yogini. So the Chaucert Yogini, 64 Yogini temples are just magnificent because either the images are standing, they're life-size if they're seated or they're standing and they're very beautiful. Some of them have wonderful hairdos and bejeweled like you cannot even imagine. And the one in Orissa that I went to, uh, you know, very close to Bhuvaneshwar, has smaller ones so that you can sit into puja and see them in front of you. Not like in, if you go to Bhera Ghat in Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh, then you have big ones. It's very sad that many of them have been desecrated willfully. People have gone and broken them and, you know, not like the kind of uh, image that they portray of a very bold woman. I mean, think of goddesses who are not spousified. Lakshmi had to be spousified at some point in history. She had to get a spouse. She had to get Vishnu. Parvati, who was an independent goddess, at one point she had to get a spouse because society had moved towards marriage becoming important. So the divinities had to be shown to be also married couples. Mm. But these 64 yoganis are without any male, only female divinities. So That's the power. Raw form of... Raw form. And the, the fact that the temples were built at such a cost, royalty was involved. Rich people were involved. They knew the efficacy of... Worshipping these Chaucet Yoganis. Speaking about temples, I have to take you to the Kamakya Devi temple. Yes. Have Kamakya. you been there yourself? I've been there. Okay. BBC made a film with me. It's there online. You can see it. Okay. I did a film with them. Yeah. One thing I've understood is it's possibly, correct me if I'm wrong, the most powerful Devi temple yeah. anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, wow, you, you're agreeing. So, uh, 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 yes, in a way, it is because it's so mysterious. It's so scary in a way. It's all in darkness. You've been there. I have not been there. Uh, yeah, you, the, the, when you go into the cave, you can also feel very suffocated because there are lots of people. I went during the festival time. They also say that Tantrics and Aghoris yeah. carry out their own practices yes, there. And yes. I've heard people also say that's an entirely Tantric temple, which yeah. is visited by visitors, but it's meant for Tantric practices. Yeah. So the rich people still do the sacrifices there of uh, bulls and buffaloes and all that. The rich people do. They say it's banned, but I saw it with my own eyes. I was uh, I was walking around in the temple. It was very hot at that time, so I was given socks. I came back to the hotel with blood-soaked socks. And I didn't have another pair, and I was with the BBC team who are so particular when they're filming anything. I had to actually use it again the next day. So I was in the kitchen sick, cleaning out the blood, so much of blood everywhere on the entire temple grounds, I can't tell you. How much? And they put the head on the thal and take it down to the what? goddess. I've seen the sacrifices. And the beauty, I, I don't want to say beauty. You have to respect each region's culture. I'm sitting there. There's, there's, it's like you have steps there to watch the sacrifices taking place. So I saw these beautiful young Assamese women. They had come from far. You know, all the tickets up free. Ho jata. It's free to travel during that time. Ambabasi or whatever that festival, October festival is called. And they were lifting their babies like this to see the sacrifices, you know, because they were sitting there and they were lifting like that. And they were all watching like intent. And I said, why are you doing that? They said, if we watch the sacrifice, the bull being killed for the goddess, then our entire year will be so good. We will not fall sick. All very much. It's just part of their culture. They say it proudly. That's why we watch. And I said, my God, I'm not scared of the blood, not scared of the gore, not scared of that decapitated head. Because after all, Shakti, in the Devi Mahatmaya, she has to kill that Mahishasur, who is the buffalo demon. And I think it goes back to a time when there must have actually been women who used to capture buffaloes. Buffaloes were a big, you know, in the marshy lands, there could be very much a problem, uh, you know, for the agricultural areas, etc. So there may have been women, actual women who captured them. And then, then the whole story of Durga unfolds, you know where they talk about he was actually a shape-shifting asura. Mm. And, uh, you know, she, and then the beauty of Kali and her tongue and how she, uh, you know, look at the way our Hindu myths are. At one level, the people who don't like the actual story of Kali 
they'll say she sticks out her tongue. Why? Tell me. You tell me why does she stick out her tongue? Why is her tongue always? You can never have a kali without a tongue sticking out. I believe it's to look fierce. Like it's like sort. You know how they do the in New Zealand they do that dance, the yeah. warrior dance. Yeah. Haka. Okay. It's sort of the Indian version of that. Okay. So let me tell you what the people believe who are orthodox and like this version. They say she was dancing. She went on a rampage. She was you know bloodthirsty and she was so. happy that she had killed uh, she had killed chanda chanda and munda that's why she was then called chamunda okay so she killed chanda munda both asuras and she was dancing away and then this uh, and you know killing every there was mayhem everywhere she was destroying the earth in her bloodthirstiness she just had no control and then shiva then everyone went running to shiva that please you're the savior please save her and, I, and that's one thing i write a lot in my books he's not the destroyer he's the savior so please help she's your wife after all in another manifestation so he comes and lies down like a corpse in front of her and she jumps on top of him and when she realizes that this is my husband she takes and you know how people take out their tongue mm. even they're embarrassed now this some women in odisha when they were being interviewed said that this is the reason why she does it no she does it because she wants to take that you know rakta beach story rakta beach is an asura the moment you hit him and a drop of blood falls on the ground another clone will come up another rakta beach will come up that's the the beach the blood of rakta rakta is blood so she her she has a lolling long tongue that before the blood touches the ground and another rakta beach comes up she sucks up that blood you know it has drama it has it it's so grotesque it's so gory and i live in that world of reading the devi mahatma and seeing all this and that's why i don't like it like one publisher told me i said i want to show durga should have her legs uh, you know properly seated on the on the on the lion not on one side like they show now how can you ride a lion like that so let us sit astride no neelima we can't i said make her wear a short skirt and then may, let us like i see in the sculptures the ancient sculptures no neelima we can't do it there will be people who disapprove of that so we look at ancient sculptures we look at ancient texts we know what the god how the goddess was portrayed at that time and i have written about it in my book shakti i'm not scared in the kamakya temple did you yes. see any aghoris yourself yes i saw and yes. what's the vibe of being around aghoris the the vibe of aghoris is one thing is a, they also worship women so they were cleaning the feet of actual living women because it's shakti it's female so did, I, did that's what i saw not mine i had all this <laughs> <laughs> i had socks on and i was with the brits i was with the bbc uh, it's a it's a film called when god when god was a girl So they were going to they, they the acting I had to do was to be a professor who is roaming around the temple and then they come and ask me and say what is the concept of shakti and then I speak to them that's the role I played in that BBC thing that was in 2012 or 2011 long back so no they didn't do mine but I I know that they do do that they wash the feet they may be drinking the water also but they show a lot of respect to the to feminine energy so every woman has that feminine energy and that's what's believed of shakti. every fe- female and the, the it's the males who create her in one uh, brahmanical version but actually she's always been there but in one version they say that it's from the tejas of the of the male divinities that she's created and you know many feminist scholars don't like that because they said what is this but it's there i'd probably like to believe that first there was a woman yes because all of us have come out of a woman yeah why would the universe not work in that manner then patriarchy took over and men were everything patriarchy took over all cultures not just indian culture yeah uh, that's what dr prabhakar yes. also said about yes. africa yeah he said that when they actually started seeing signs and symbols inside the pyramids inside ancient african structures in, inside ancient south american yes, pyramids yes 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 what they figured is there was lots of phases of human history where society was mostly matriarchal yes in some cases to a toxic degree Uh, yes yes but, it can be yeah. power <laughs> yeah but uh, ancient civilizations always try transferring knowledge forward to future generations mm-hmm. and the one thing that was constantly transferred was male and female equality yeah. the equality of all human beings yeah. and in saying all that i still believe and maybe it's because i am sort of into devi worship right yeah, now yeah, yeah. i feel we all came out of a woman yeah. so yeah. somewhere maybe i'm 51% on the side yes. of matriarchy yes 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 and what i do love very much is uh, when i go through the purans and i see how parvati is depicted usually in most of the puran she's very submissive to shiva 
Then I found these absolute nuggets. I found these beautiful episodes. There's one episode in which she makes him take off his loincloth while they're playing Chaucer. And uh, she, he always wins. And there's always this competition between the two of them that Shiva is more powerful than Shakti. But Shakti was also very powerful when we go back to the matriarchal past. And uh, so she says, uh, she, she wins at one time. And when she wins, she just takes, tells him, take off that, that crescent moon on your head. And he takes it off and gives it to her. She makes a hole in it and she wears it on as an ear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the Purans, it's written like that. Then she looks at him and she makes him take off. He's got Rudraksh and all. She doesn't like the snakes at all, but she said, take off the snakes. He loves his snakes. He's very thonic. He's very earthy, no? the ground. So she takes the snakes. And also I've read that poison, you know, he's so poisonous himself. Only he can handle poison. Someone who himself is fierce and strong can handle the snake's poison. But anyway, then she takes the snakes away. And then finally she said, I've won in Chaucer. Now you take off your loincloth. And then finally Shiva speaks. Up till now he's not spoken. He said, you want me to go around naked? What kind of wife are you? And then she says, you did that. Don't you remember how you seduced all the sages' wife in so-and-so episode in the Daruvan episode? You know, so she, it's such a nice egalitarian relationship that I see between Shiva and Parvati, which you don't ever see this kind of dialogue between any other couple. Explain the word egalitarian. Egalitarian, very equal. Like they play Chaucer, they play board games, they go swimming together. They, they Very often they're discussing the Purans. So you'll see images of her with her hand on her chin like this, and he's talking. Very often he's asking her questions. She's talking. So they, they, they both give each other space, and he's decorating her with flowers. She's decorating him with flowers. And one of my favorite sculptures is, you know, whenever Shiva and Parvati are shown together in a loving way, in, methun, in a methun way as a couple, you know, he, she's either sit, seated in his lap and his hand is cupping her breast and blah, blah, blah. In some images you'll see, she has got her hand around his shoulder and she's having, because he's taller than her, she's having it. The sculptor has done such a wonderful job showing her, straining her hand, but she's also, not just the man puts his hand around my shoulder. How many times have you seen in India a woman putting her hand around a man's shoulder, especially in olden, maybe now? And in those ancient sculptures, we were seeing Parvati do it to Shiva and I was en entranced when I saw those images and I put them in my first book and I wrote about it. I said, look at Parvati, because they had that kind of relationship. She used to get very angry. They used to have such fights, I can't tell you. Just like any married couple, showing how couples can fight. He teases her, he calls her Kali. She says, how can you call me Kali? You're the one who's called Mahakal. So a punning taking place also over there. You're the one who's called Mahakal. Where am I, Kali? And in most of the other ones, you'll, uh, Purans, you'll see, she goes running and she does penance and she becomes gory. In one, she insults him. She says, you're a rogue. You're a skull carrier. I, I, you're giving me a headache. I don't want to have anything to do with you. And she goes away. So there are these things which male historians don't want to talk about because that shows the male god in bad light. But when I saw them, I emphasized them, that there was a consciousness in the past when the Purans were being written where women were also strong and had a voice in a marriage also. He mm -hmm. said, I don't want to have children. I'll, I was never born. I, was, I will never die. Why do human beings want, why do men want children so that they can do the Agni at the death? I will never die. I will never have children. And he used to run away from her. She made her own Ganesha. That's how autonomous she was. That's how much of a mind she was. Look at the myths like that. And they empower you and they make you feel so good. I can talk to you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk to you also. I like listening. Now you tell me something. You tell me what do you feel about uh, Shakti, the book. Like, I mean, you talked about yantras. Uh, yantras, the geometrical representation of the goddess. Some people don't want to see her anthropom anthropomorphically, which means as a human being. They want to see her in a diag diagrammatic form or geometrical form. So they use yantra. That's another thing. There's such a variety. You can just... Recite mantras of the goddess and she'll appear in front of you. You can do the yantras and she'll appear in front of you. You can see her image and she'll appear in front of you. Just a red dot. That's the beauty of Hinduism, which I want. I want this to be open. I don't want anyone to try and straight jack it and say, this is the only representation of the goddess. This is the only holy book. I mean, the British came, I think, at that time and they made Bhagavad Gita the holy book, in, which we have to swear upon in the courts. How many people worship, I mean, uh, see it as their main religious text? I don't think there are many. If you do a survey, I don't think there are many. Many people believe in the Devi Mahatmaya, all of, uh, you know, 
Odessa and uh, Bengal, they favor that. Many people prefer Ram Charitmanas. Many love Valmiki's Ramayana. There are different texts. We don't have one text. We don't have one form of representation. And that is the beauty of Hinduism. Yeah. Um, best job in the world. I have. <laughs> yes, this is what are. I do for a living. <laughs> like this is like absorbing all this. Yes. The stage I'm at in life is very curious. I'm still seeking, yes. meditating for years. Yeah. Um, I'll be very raw and honest here. I can't stop thinking about that podcast with Raja Nandi, who was the tantric. Okay. Okay. Because it shifted my path okay. a little bit for sure. Okay. It's got me more inclined towards Devi. Mm -hmm. It's got me more inclined towards learning about it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm at. Then parallel your book enters my life at that same time. Just imagine. <laughs> now, See? coincidence or what? <laughs> You're also like a big part of this shift. Uh, something uh, spiritually changing very heavily in my life. At the end of those podcasts with Rajashi Nandi, when I was talking to him outside, he just looked at me for a bit and I'm telling him something and I can clearly tell he's thinking about something else. And he's like, listen, I think you can do Devi Upasana if you want. You've earned it like because you've been meditating for a while. So I think your body is ready for it. Okay. And I said, cool. And then he gave me like a tiny mantra, uh -huh. which I've been doing and I can feel the effects of okay. it in my life. So that's where I'm at. They say the teacher appears when the student is ready. Yes. Um, I look at your book as a teacher. Wonderful. At this point, like at least you're my, you're my second standard teacher you're, and I've gone to... You're paying me the best compliments. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I can say. Uh, but those pages with the yantras on them, those caught my attention because I just feel people don't understand what yantras are in the yeah. mainstream. Yeah. People don't understand that symbols have power. Yes. Uh, I love podcasting because I get a 360 degree view from other cultures as well. That's right. Uh, I'd love to know about Yantra usage a little bit more from you because I feel there's certain things you couldn't write in that book. Uh, yes, I mean, we we had so much, I mean, though it's 200,000 words, believe me. And, and about the book, you know, when you talk about power and Shakti and you talk, do you know the book was written, it's 200,000 words and it was written in just less than six months while I was taking online classes. It was like I, some kind of frenzy came over me. Yeah, the book is written with a lot of ferociousness yes. and I'm saying that as a compliment. <laughs> but my question is very simple. Of course, I'm not going to do this, but it is a question. If I draw a big Tarama Yantra in my room, because I feel drawn to Tara right yeah. now, yeah. what effect will it have? It can only have a good effect, I'm sure about that. If you feel like it, yeah, it can only have, if you believe in it, and you're looking at it constantly. Nothing. I, I, I mean, I see, I, I haven't done anything like that myself. But um, I do believe in uh, the mala, the mala jap. I think it's wonderful. I think it's very empowering. Whichever mantra you use, if you have a guru, the guru tells you which mantra to use. Or you choose yourself. Like I said, we all have the autonomy to choose ourselves. So uh, I do believe in it. And I, 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 I know that many bhaks do it like hundreds of times. I think just once is enough. 108 beads do it on the favorite beads that that divinity likes. It just makes your mind so still. Mm. And I've written about this in another book of mine. Ekagrata is required. One mind concentration, ekagrata, is required for any good profession or anything in life. And you know that, right? it's a cliche, whether you're eating, whether you're exercising, that one, that kind of devotion you give to that one thing. And that is what a writer does, at, at, at least I did with this book when I wrote it in six months, when all the libraries were shut and the people were dying left, right and center pandemic. I was very sorry, sad because I lost some people also whom I knew. And yet I just, yeah, you're right. You're so intuitive when you said ferociously, because that's exactly what I did. Night and day. I would be woken up with dreams of the goddesses I was writing about. Yeah, I can tell. And I would get up and go to my study and my husband said, my husband just has got used to me being mad. My study was next door in the old house that I used to live in. I used to go turn on that small lamp. But I would just be woken up in the middle of the night. And, and dreams with deities are not to be looked at as simple dreams. Yeah. There's something more divine that's yeah. happening. Yeah. It is a blessing. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cute little anecdote which I want to tell you. Sure. I wrote a book called Rudra, The Idea of Shiva, which is a biography of Shiva's life. And it's written in the first person. All the gods, Vishnu says, I am Vishnu. I am the arch rival of Shiva. He does this, he does that, like that. It's all in the first person. So then Ganesha, he writes. And in my dream, I got this, you know, you, there is an image called Nritta Ganapati, in which he's dancing. 
And then there's Natraj. Shiva is the great dancer. What is Shiva? He's the ultimate dancer. And in my dream, it came that Ganesha is trying to mimic his father, but his big stomach is coming in the way. And he's so unhappy because he can't dance as beautifully as his father. I woke up in the middle of the night. It's not in any Puran or anything. And I wrote it in the book. And people have asked me, that's so cute that the father's, I said, he has such an Conf conflict because he has this thing that he's not as good as his father, but he wants to be. So he also dances. He also carries the trishul. He also tries to be as great as Shiva, but he can't be. He envies his father in a way. Where did that come from, Nilima? Which Purana? I said, no, Purana, it was my dream. <laughs> so it's like that. You can dream and it's like somebody is telling you this. Somebody is actually coming into your dream and telling you this and you must immediately act upon it. Like write it down because you'll tend to forget yeah. the next day. Important for all creative <laughs> All creative people. So you would know that. Um, you know, when you're translating words from Indian languages like Sanskrit to any other language, there's a loss of information as is the case with any, if you translate from Japanese into English, yes, there'll be a loss yes, of information. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm going to try my best to explain Tantra a little more so that we can understand Yantras more. Okay. Uh, the word Tantra loosely translates to technique, Yeah. I believe. It consists of mantras and yantras. Mantras yeah. loosely could be understood as spells. Yeah. Again, I'm trying to talk to a Western audience yeah. here. Uh, and yantras is tools. Yeah. You know, things yeah. that help forward your practice. Yeah. And if you learn how to use mantras and yantras correctly, your process of tantra moves forward. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And correct. you need a guru to teach you this. Yeah. There are certain rules you can't. Uh, I believe that if you draw the yantra on a wall, yeah. uh, there'll be certain rules that you'll have to follow in your life. After talking to that Rajashi Nandi, at every stage of my questions about Tantra, he was talking about rules and disciplines. So okay. I'm sure that there are rules and disciplines. Yeah. But I also believe uh, that somewhere it's a mata. Yeah. You know, like even this particular uh, murti, like yeah. in front of us, yeah. it's got so much power. And I... After that podcast, this is the only podcast where I've brought it out. Oh, yeah. wonderful. It's, otherwise, it's kept in my room. And I'm so honored. <laughs> because, I mean, it's so weird. Yes. Why did Kola happen yesterday? Yes. You know, why are you coming why today? Why did you go to the temple? This, yeah. Something yeah. important yeah. about this conversation. And also, I, how did you didn't know that I was planning to come to Bombay? You know, this is just amazing. Yeah. yeah. That the events aligned. Yeah, yeah. It all aligned. Um, yeah. Which is why that Kola, I mean, invited us. Yes. Like, we didn't choose to go there. That's right. Uh, and the same with this conversation. That's right. That's right. Uh, when I'm ready to learn more about Devi, yeah. you're coming into my life. Which yeah. is why, even though you're a Shiva expert, I'm continuously taking you to like Devi because you're answering my questions. But uh, so the Shiva was a, uh, you know, that was my PhD and I got, wrote books on Shiva, but I've also written at least four books on the Devi. So it's not that she's, you can't take her away from Shiva. Okay. They both are so closely connected with each other. Shiva Shakti, they say that without, without the Shakti, Shiva can't even move a limb, not even a finger. He's like a corpse. Have you met Tantrics? Uh, nobody wants, wants to openly admit that they are Tantric and they're very secretive and they, uh, they will allow you to meet them only if you're ready to become a Tantric. If you say that, yes, I'm ready to become a practitioner, uh, then they will talk to you. But I have heard of people, because many people come and talk to me about the religious practices. So I know that uh, people have tried tantric rituals in very dire circumstances and terrible things have still happened to them. It's not like those things haven't happened. But they, when, when uh, there was one person I know, he was going to be put, I mean, I knew him through someone into jail for some kind of reason. And they did it, but he still went. He still had to suffer. What terrible so, things can happen as an outcome of tantra? No, I don't know. Terrible things can happen. I wouldn't say that. I was saying his, what terrible things had to happen in his life still happened. Okay. It's not like he was saved from it. Mm. Um, see, Tantra is mixed with Hinduism. It's not exactly separate. This whole idea of smearing, you know, putting on a til tilak and all, it's all Tantric. Hinduism didn't have all that. Many puja rites and all that we just practice ordinarily are all Tantric in nature. Yeah. They're, they're intertwined with each other. Yeah. Yeah, there are, but uh, it's such an, or, yeah, the certain rites which are very extreme, that are, those are done by tantrics, yeah. so, you know, in the in the quiet of the night and they have their own group and their own secrecy and they don't want everyone to know. They don't want everyone to get that power. Mm. Apparently they get the power. But I mean, um, I'm not a tantric, but queer things have happened to me also where people have said that they've seen Shakti on my face. I feel that. Uh, okay, I so feel that as well. Lots of people have told me that. And then 
when I so I come out of a temple, just went there to survey the temple, the Iskon temple, to give you an example. And a couple came out of the temple, and I was with this Australian girl who was a Iskon. So she's, I said, I'll accompany you. I've never gone to Iskon, but I'll accompany you. I'll drive you there. And I just came out of the temple. I was just standing there, and this couple came out. She had a garland in her hand. She bowed down to me, put the garland on me, and walked away. So I said, maybe that's an Iskon practice. The first person you see when you come out of the temple, you have to garland her. So I told my friend, her name was Angela. Angela, do they always do this? She said, no. Why did she do that to you? I said, I have no idea why she did that to me. So things like that have happened to me many times. So I'm not saying it, but other people have said it. Other people have said it. And one lady actually got a little annoyed with me because I said, she called me up while I was driving to college. And she said, ma'am, us din aap the, that day you came. Can I speak in Hindi? Yeah. Us din aap the office, aap apni kitab lene, or nahi kitab lene, or uh, humne kuch aap ki shakal pe dekha. As in, you, came, you came to get your book? You, I, you came to get your new book. That was my second book. It's called Invoking Goddesses, Gender Politics and Indian Religion. So she said, you came to pick up your book and I saw something on your face. So I got a little nervous. I was driving. I made a joke. I said, I don't know what her name is, Mrs. Gulati. Or something. Mrs. Gulati, my kajal fell. Gaya hoga. Maybe my makeup got messed up. That's what you saw. She got actually angry. She said, you're doing a joke. We didn't see it. When you left, the artist who does the covers now came running to me and said, did you see? Did you see what was on her face? Did you see? Did you see? And then I said, kya dekha aapne? And I was still driving. And I still remember where I was. I was in front of that Bairo Mark. You know, that's the route I used to take to college. I said, kya dekha? She said, humne shakti dekhi. Now you can't, I don't know that lady at all. She knows I'm a professor. That's about it. She said, then I told her, I said, aapko malum hai kitni khushi hoti hai? Because I'm a skeptic also. So I said, you saw happiness. I get my book and the cover is looking so beautiful. I said, I was so happy. You saw Ronak of happiness. You saw that look. She said, nay, ma'am. Aapko nay malum na. Chodo aap. She was disgusted. Chodo. Humne shakti dekhi. Hume malum hai humne kya dekhi. Yeah. So when people say things like that, then that's their faith. That's their belief. You somehow then have to go with it. But I'm still somewhere a little bit of a skeptic. You don't do mantra jap yourself? Well, I have to admit that when I was around 11, 12 years old, um, I was very chanchal. I was very bad in studies, barely passing. And uh, one person whom my mother knew came to my house. He saw my palm and he saw my janam patri. He said, all she has to do is this jap. Okay, she said my this daughter, she doesn't concentrate at all. She's always playful. She never studies for her exams and all this, that and the other. So he said, tell her to do this. And he wrote it down on a piece of paper, the mantra. And I have kept that to this day with me. And I do it when I want to feel empowered. It's a Shiva mantra. And I'm never, no, it's actually not a Shiva mantra, but I also do a Shiva mantra. And I actually have never said this publicly, but I'm saying it today because I actually, through this podcast, also want to help people that all this is not mumbo jumbo. Here is a person who's from Delhi University who teaches in a college. I'm so much older. You know, look at my age. I'm going to retire in some years. Know that there is something in all this. Don't just dismiss it all. The japa, which I was saying, the mala jap, is a wonderful thing. Get the good, right mantra because what it gives you and what you need in life is concentration. You will get that concentration. Whether you want to associate it with the deity, whether you want to associate it with the religion, whether you want to associate it with psychology, I don't care. It has helped me in my lifetime. I don't do it every day. No, I do it when I want to feel empowered. Okay. But maybe if you are living this life where you're chasing this knowledge constantly, you're also attracting these elements into your life. That's why people are feeling that Devi energy in you. So what one person told me, I was uh, there's this beautiful text called Sondarya Lahiri. I cannot tell you how beautiful it is by Adi Shankaracharya. And I was uh, going to give a talk in Oxford University on the Sondarya Lahiri. That you, you flow in the wave of the beauty of the goddess. It's such a beautiful book, I can't tell you. Scriptures, it's scriptures. So uh, I, had to, I wanted to interview some men. Then what do they get out of it? Because it's a completely... Head to toe description, physical description of the goddess in a very explicit way, almost embarrassing way, the way they describe it. So I interviewed women and I interviewed men. 
So one man was in Chennai. I called him up. I, I got his number from someone that he decided to search Sondarya Lahiri almost every week or whatever. It's a long hundred, hundred verses book, scripture. So first he told me what he gets out of it, how he feels good, how he feels empowered, how he can visualize the Devi because it's, you know, from the head to toe, Keshadi Pad, you know, from the Kesh to the Pad description of the goddess. And then he said, he said, you know, up, you know he, he, he was speaking in English, your ancestors said, somebody has their hand on your head even now. So I said, why? He said, do you know of anyone who's worked so much on gods and goddesses? I said, no, there's nobody in my ancestry. So he said, but there is somebody. Because all my life, I'm an 80-year-old man. All my life, I would have loved doing what you're doing today. How is it that you're getting to do it and I didn't get to do it? I tried my best. And you're doing it. Look at you. How do you look at this new generation consuming this content while they're in college and teenagers? Is there an awakening happening? There is definitely a pride in being uh, of a certain religion. There's no doubt we see that and that it can have its extreme right wing thing, which also we don't like and approve of. There is definitely a desire to know more about one's own culture. There's no doubt about that. And also, I think because it's helping their peers, they are g going towards it. Because if parents tell you to do it, no one's going to listen to you. Mostly people, teenagers will not listen to their parents. Oh, their mumbo jumbo, whatever. But when their own peers have experienced something, like if you say that I went to that temple and I experienced an energy, then they will want to experience it too. And then they start experiencing it. And I think that's what's happening. That's, it's just leading, you know, it has that effect. Yeah. Um, one last question for you okay. on the show. I feel uh, darker entities are also associated with Shaktism in yeah. some form. Yeah. So whether it is theoretical knowledge you have or practical experience, I'd love to hear what you have to say. And so the audience that I can... Whether I've it. had a dark, darker experience. Yes. Yeah. Considering the fact that your intuition is also where it is. Like, do you ever enter a room or a place and feel like, okay, it's just some wrong energy. Yes. And I've been proven right. The man has died within a few weeks. Terribly, just unexpectedly. I went into a house once and I started... And it sometimes shows itself physically like I start getting a stomach ache for no reason. And I had to leave. I told my husband, let's get, go from here. Something's happening to me. I get up. I get that. And he was, not only was he very nasty to me, he's very nasty to me for no reason. Who? This person's house who I went to. They invited me for dinner. And uh, he was nasty. When, and how he was nasty was, and I can even tell you that he took out a book written by some foreign scholar, not scholar, writer, in which he's writing very ugly things about Shiva and Nandi. I don't want, the, the act you can well imagine that, that Nandi does this to Shiva or something. something. And all the dinner people, all the people who were invited were sitting there and he started reading that out and he said, you, you write about this. They, God, Shiva, look at what's being said about him. So I told the man, I said, is this a place to discuss this right now? I mean, I can intellectually discuss this with you, what is being said, but not at this dinner party. And I started, to, uh, before that itself, I was having an uneasiness in the stomach and all that. And it didn't take much time. He, there was something wrong in that house. It was darkness, like I told you, what happened with the student. And he, he passed away shortly after that. Just, just out of the blue. So yes, sometimes one can sense it and it is scary. I'm not saying it's, it doesn't empower me. I don't feel empowered by this kind of intuition. I mean, it, it, sometimes the intuition is nice. Somebody said they've left me a gift and I was able to say exactly what it was. It was a particular perfume and I knew that that would be it. And I said, gosh, how does one know this? Those are funny things, you know. Maybe it was just a coincidence. But, uh, and sometimes it can help you. Like somebody was going to give me some bad news and I already knew while I was doing yoga what that news would be. So I was ready with my answer. I didn't cry. I didn't weep. I didn't anything. I just gave my answer to that person right then and there because I had got the intuition. This is why he wants to meet me. He wants to give me this bad news. Okay. So yes. Um, you know, I'll tell you what. Throughout my 20s, I've always visualized what will happen three years later, four years later and everything's come true. Uh -huh. And I've just, I'm going to turn 30 this year. Yeah, wow. And I've hit a point where for some reason, the images related to visualization are not forming in my head for my late 30s and 40s and 50s. And that makes me think that, one, I don't want to die early. <laughs> <laughs> and two, uh, maybe I'm not supposed to think that far. Yeah. Which is why I'm just in the moment now trying to absorb things yes. from the people I'm I meeting. I think that's wonderful, a very nice way to look at it. Just move with the flow like this, the cliches. Just let it go. And whatever you feel like doing, do it. You wanted to bring this murti here today, you brought it. I mean, 
you want to have this talk we having this talk just do what you feel like doing and you're go- doing so well my god <laughs> you're you. on the right path <laughs> yeah and if so many people are learning things through your podcast i mean that's that's the beauty sharing i mean i mean i said empathy in my empathy and compassion it means also sharing what you know don't hold i tried my best not to hold back today mm. just share so people can learn or people people may like it they may not like it that's up to them There's a lot more conversations in you. Maybe when I'm a little bit older. Okay. A little bit older could even mean like six months from now. Okay. But I need I need some time to think, grow more, and then come back to you. So sorry and thank you at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank ma'am. you. So that was the episode for today. Don't have too much to say in this outro. All I want to say is that it's a blessing for me to talk to blessed souls like Dr. Chidgo, and. It's an even bigger blessing to extract the wisdom that these great souls have accumulated over the years. This was a very heartfelt conversation from my end because at this stage of life, I'm trying to understand the divine feminine much more deeply. Not just to balance out my own inner world, but also because the divine feminine, if you truly understand it in its spiritual sense, contains so much power that it has the capability to protect you. from anything it has the capability of elevating you up to any point and it has the capability of giving you absolutely what you need from this lifetime and occasionally it has the capability of giving you what you want from this lifetime what i will say is that all these processes become faster through the process of meditation make sure you download our meditation app level super mind especially if you want to begin your meditation process It's now live on the App Store, on the Play Store. You'll earn yourself a one-week free trial. And what I will also say is, keep following TRS for more. Every episode of TRS is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world, because we're a Spotify exclusive. The Renvi Show will be back very soon. Thanks for your support. Keep learning along with me.